Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining Georgetown University International Business School BRICS webinar series episode two. So my name is Daso Kim from Zips, and I'll be your host today. And today we have an we have invited an honorable guest speaker, Professor Shiv Mehta, Ben Chen Ling Chair, Professor of International Finance at Waxi University, India. He's also the author of Protocols of Money, which he wrote during his MBA at New York University Stern. He's also a limited partner at a Sydney-based based VC firm that invests in metaverse and blockchain startup. So today he'll be delivering a keynote with a topic of what would a BRICS currency look like and it impa its impact on the dollar? Interesting topic. After the keynote, we'll have a discussion session along with the Q&A session. And we've invited two amazing panelists. You can see here, Professor Michael Song, a co-director of Institute of Digital Finance Innovation, as well as entrepreneur and investor. Also, we have invited Professor David Wan, who is on his way to this Zoom meeting. Professor of Zips, Executive De Deputy Director of International Research Center for FinTech Security. So during the presentation, feel free to leave your Q&A in the chat box or Q&A box you can see in the bottom pack line. And uh, we'll, we'll, when we reach the Q&A session, we'll deliver about your questions. So now let me invite Professor Shu Meda for his keynote. So Professor Shu, floor is yours. Thanks a lot. So, is my voice uh, audible? Yep. Perfect. Very clear. Perfect. Yep. Let me share my screen. If you can allow me to share my screen, I've created like a deck uh, so that it goes along um, uh, with me talking. This is definitely an interesting topic, and uh, I'm very thankful for uh, Chichang University and Waxin University to give me the opportunity to also speak along with esteemed guests uh, that I really look up to after I read about them. Uh, like Professor Michael and like Professor David, who's going to be joining us soon. So let me see. Let me know if my screen is uh, visible now. If it's yes, shared. it's visible. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm familiar over here, everybody would be familiar with uh, who the participants of uh, the BRICS are. Uh, it was initially a term that was coined by a Goldman Sachs uh, uh, analyst that, uh, and it was in early of the millennium. It was in early 2000 uh, that the Goldman Sachs uh, analyst uh, and economist, uh, you know, came up with the term that BRICS are going to be really powerful nations in the geopolitical and the global economic world. Um, and as most of us would know, it comprises of uh, China, uh, Russia, Brazil, India, and South Africa. Uh, over time, uh, they have become increasingly more powerful, which I'll first you know, introduce it as a prelude uh, before we talk about what a BRICS currency would look like. Um, so these are the participants and uh, they, did their first summit actually in 2009. So even though the term was introduced in early 2000, uh, the nations actually, you know, came together to come up with more economic cooperation um, in 2009 for the first time. As we can see, BRICS is actually a very powerful group of five countries. 42% uh, of the population are within these countries. Uh, they comprise 30% of the land area, 26% of GDP with the lion's share being in China uh, is within BRICS um, and uh, other nations are now contributing even further. And 20% of the exports and imports so in terms of the global trade is done within these five nations. Uh, so they are very powerful and they are increasingly becoming more powerful, uh, especially since COVID uh, struck. And, uh, you know, since the 24th of Feb invasion of Ukraine, uh, things have escalated at a very geopolitical level uh, that is making these nations unite further uh, against their, you know, competing against the dollar hegemony. 
These are some projections that have been done again by analysts, uh, you know, around uh, what the economy, around what the BRICS economy would look like. Um, they comprise uh, less than uh, the G6 economy at the moment, but uh, they are predicting that by 2040, these five nations are going to overtake the G6 economy uh, that comprises the likes of UK, France, Germany, Japan. Uh, so BRICS over time are going to be the leading group of nations uh, if you discount uh, America from it. So one of the big, th one of the major geopolitical events, as we all know, that have happened uh, this year was the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Um, this talk is not about why that happened, uh, but this talk is about what the BRICS is doing as, you know, after that. So when the BRICS summit took place, uh, which was the 14th uh, BRICS summit as the first one took place in 2009, um, this BRICS summit happened virtually and President Putin announced uh, during that summit that the BRICS nations are working on an international cur currency that was currently in works. This was announced in June. Um, and after that, it hit the all, you know, major you publications. Know. It hit all the major publications out there uh, that the BRICS nations are serious about competing against the dollar hegemony. But it, there weren't any clear indications as to what this BRICS currency would look like. And to be honest, uh, so far, it isn't clear as well. Uh, although close cooperation and close research has been announced uh, to develop some sort of a basket of currency that uh, may look like the euro or may look like the special drawing rights uh, that are you know, of IMF. So before we get deep into you know, what would a BRICS currency would look like and what the BRICS nations have done so far to reach that stage since they uh, started this in 2009, this economic cooperation, let's look at what global reserve currencies pot we have gone through so far. Uh, so I wrote a book on the history and evolution of money. So I know quite a lot about how money has evolved in recorded human history. Uh, we've gone from, you know, using barter system to then using things like uh, dog's teeth in certain civilizations, to then using silver coin, uh, silver backed coins, uh, to then gold backed coins. But over time, with, you know, powers uh, having a lot of influence at a global level, this is a more accurate uh, depiction of how global reserve currency since 1450 because after that, the recorded human history has been very accurate to a certain extent. Uh, we have witnessed the evolution of global reserve currency at this stage. Um, so as you can see from here, reserve currencies have mostly been uh, you know, eradicated and then a new one came after the limitation of the old one have been witnessed uh, after every 80 to 100 years. You know, there was the Spanish uh, Spanish civilization was very influenced uh, during the 16th century, and their reserve currency were there for around 110 years. Then came the Dutch. And there was a Bank of Amsterdam at that time that were very influential, uh, but uh, people lost trust with the Central Bank of Dutch, and uh, you know uh, their uh, global reserve currency status was challenged. And then, of course, uh, the recorded human history that happened during British civilization and post that is well re received, well recorded. Um, it was during the World War II uh, that uh, uh, eventually with the Bretton Woods Conference that uh, dollar became the global reserve currency and um, uh, IMF, World Bank, all these institutions were formed. Uh, but before dollar, it used to be the British pound sterling. But now, you know, British pound sterling, nobody thinks of it as a global reserve currency. So if we look at this pattern, it's fair to say that uh, the dollar has uh, reigned supreme for more than 100 years now. And uh, if we look at the pattern, it's uh, fair to say that uh, there are other competitors out there that are looking to compete against it. To it. Uh, when Euro was formed in 2000, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, commentators, economists thought that Euro might be the one that may be able to compete against dollar for the global reserve currency. 
but we have over time witnessed the challenges uh, of uh, a region unified currency that lacks fiscal uh, coordination because fiscal policy and monetary policy needs to go some somewhat hand in hand uh, for the regional economy to thrive. So uh, with that, with that uh, you know, history in mind, let's look at how dominant US dollar is at the moment and what has happened over time with the US dollar. So US dollar is still the, one of the most traded currency in the foreign exchange market, although Chinese renminbi is uh, increasingly getting traded. Uh, however, it's still not that much. Dollar still is traded the most. And when we look at foreign exchange reserves by currency held by other countries, majority of the countries still hold 60% of American dollar. This is as per uh, 2021. Uh, but if you look at the latest figures, 60%, there would have been a drop from that number since Russia, China, they all are selling most of their American dollars within their reserves. Uh, however, still American dollar has got the lion's share. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Um, IMF, as you all know, International Monetary Fund, uh, this was formed after uh, you know, World War II and the Bretton Woods Conference that took place in 1944. When that took place, one needs to realize and understand our history that India and China were very different countries back in 1944. India was still under the colonial rule of, uh, um, of uh, Britain and uh, China also, the present China that we know of, uh, 1944 China was very different than the China that we know after 1949. So when Bretton Woods was formed, uh, when Bretton Woods Conference took place and IMF was formed, uh, US and UK were given the lion's share of IMF voting rights. Um, and as you can see um, from this graph, which I was only able to find it as for 2014, uh, China's share of IMF voting rights is very less compared to their share of global GDP. Um, so one can argue, uh, I mean, one can not argue, it's quite evident also, if one would see, that uh, the allocation of IMF voting rights that countries like China, India have, and their share at the uh, global economic level doesn't really justify. Um, so those are the reasons why there, there were some motivations uh, to create a BRICS economic cooperation. Um, and so far, and I'll show it uh, soon, that it has been successful. Before we go into that, uh, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about special drawing rights over here, uh, which I'm not sure how many people would be aware of, uh, but special drawing rights was created by the IMF in 1969. Uh, it only included a handful of countries, and China was a late entrant, by the way. China only entered uh, the special drawing rights in 2016. Uh, these drawing rights are not currencies that you and I can own. These are done at a macro country level, uh, and it is only done as an international reserve asset. Um, the reason why it is important uh, that I discuss about this or give you an overview is that BRICS currency can move into two different ways. One is the Euro method, where uh, you and I, as private citizens of our individual countries, uh, can hold um, you know, a BRICS global reserve currency like people hold Europe, or it could take the shape of a special drawing rights where countries hold the sort, the sort of BRICS currency. So, as I mentioned, SDRs are allocated to IMF member countries, so not citizens. Uh, it is held by countries, and countries can exchange SDRs for hard countries. So they can exchange SDR or they are allocated SDR as loans. Uh, so, for example, Sri Lanka is going through a crisis at the moment. Um, they would increasingly receive more special drawing rights if they've not already received so. Um, and as you can see over here, special drawing rights are a basket of currencies with a gain the lion's share given to US dollar and then the euro and 8% uh, to British pound sterling, the forgotten global reserve currency, 8% to Japanese yen and 11% to Chinese RMB. This is just an example of how allocation of special drawing rights is done. So 
you know, country A receives an amount in proportion to his share in the IMF, and they can exchange it with country B for foreign currency reserve. Um, during this uh, volatile inflationary environment, countries like India even are selling their foreign exchange reserves uh, to maintain and uh, defend their uh, currency, which is rupee at the moment. Um, so we are increasingly seeing um, importance of having foreign exchange reserves um, during times like this. So now that I've given you an overview of uh, you know, what is happening, what is the dominance of US dollar, uh, what is special drawing rights, the global reserve currency evolution, let's look at what has happened to dollar recently. So since, again, this is an old infographic, I couldn't find it, or I couldn't create a better infographic, so I thought it, even as though it's old, it kind of depicts the evolution of it. But increasingly, more countries are not using US dollar for, bi for bilateral trade. Um, and increasingly, most of that is within the BRICS nation. As you can see with this, more than $300 billion of trade. And this is back in 2014. Uh, this has now increased to more than $1 trillion and accelerated most since the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, as you know, uh, Russia has been uh, basically kicked out of the SWIFT payment system. Uh, so they are using and increasingly selling their oil to countries like China and India, who are net importers of oil using their own currency. They're not using US dollar. Uh, and India is now, uh, like China as well, uh, increasingly suggested that they are going to use Indian rupee for global trade settlement. Uh, so especially among BRICS nation, uh, there is uh, an increase in not using US dollar. So let's come to what BRICS has done so far. So BRICS members have been building their global, they, they already had developed a bank, uh, which was around 2014. Uh, but I'm not going to be talking about the bank, uh, although it's going to be playing an influential role in the future. But when you compare the BRICS bank that they created in 2014 uh, with the initial capital of $100 billion, it is just nothing compared to the power of IMF. Uh, so for the purposes of this uh, keynote, I'll not be talking much about the bank, but the bank is going to play an influential role in the future. Uh, I'll be talking more about in this keynote about what BRICS are doing to directly compete against the dollar hegemony, which is the payment infrastructure and the currency, rather than the bank over here, because the topic about bank has been well documented since 2014. So look, BRICS members have been building their own global payment infrastructure for international transactions. Uh, however, two countries uh, that have really shown um, incredible progress in this uh, payment infrastructure which is an alternative to SWIFT, is Russia and China. Uh, Russia developed the system for transfer of financial messages, and China created the cross-border interbank payment system network, uh, which is called SIPS. Um, and they both are alternatives to the SWIFT global banking network. And they both are quite mature. Uh, India has created somewhat similar mechanism, but it, I wouldn't say that it's very mature at the moment. Um, and when it comes to the retail payment network, like, for example, China has got Union Pay, uh, Russia has got their own system, uh, India has got uh, their own system called Ru Pay. Uh, so, except South Africa, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, they've all got their own payment network as well that competes that compete against the likes of MasterCard and Visa. Uh, so, the BRICS member nations have done significant progress in developing their infrastructure when it comes to their payment system and also to their interbank uh, payment mechanism. But the interbank, interbank payment mechanism is mostly limited to Russia and China, with India, South Africa, and Brazil uh, pretty far behind compared to the two nations. Now, why would these countries unite together you know, to compete against the dollar hegemony? When you think about it from a game theory perspective, uh, and this is why it has accelerated even further, uh, since uh, uh, the invasion of Ukraine is because the purpose of a global reserve currency is supposed to be neutral. Uh, if it is termed a global reserve currency, it shouldn't pick sides, it shouldn't choose. And what has happened since the invasion of Ukraine that we have seen is that 
not only US dollar, there has been a depletion of US dollar and the US dollar has not been allowed to trade uh, with Russia, but they have also been kicked out of the payments network, uh, which is SWIFT, which is significantly used uh, by all the major banks um, across the world. Um, so when you think about it, currency and the payment network are two important pillars of uh, you know, a national currency and global trade. And uh, all these five nations, South Africa, India, Brazil, they've all experienced US sanctions in their history uh, at some point or the other. India has faced US sanctions uh, before the economic liberalization that took place in 1991. Uh, the sanctions that have taken place in Russia and China, they are quite out there um, during Trump's era and so forth as well. So all these five nations have shared frustrations, um, you know, of the, receiving U.S. sanctions in their history. And they have got strong incentives to mobilize towards de-dollarization. Now, when we talk about mobilization, there are some countries that have got or have uh, demonstrated a stronger interest towards it. One of them clearly is Russia, with President Putin expressing his interest. Uh, but China has also expressed its interest uh, to move, uh, again, you know, move away from the dollar. Um, the petro yuan trade that happened in uh, early 2010s is uh, one measure of that. Um, but all the five countries have got incentives. Although India resists a little bit because they've got healthy relations with the U.S. Um, and they also have good, fairly good diplomatic ties with Russia and China as well. Uh, but India is one of the countries that are quite hesitant to really have a strong feet towards a de-dollarization, but they are handling it diplomatically well with both US and the BRICS nation. Now, secondly, uh, BRICS actually, when it was formed um, and gathered in 2009, they demonstrated an interest in that time and set one of the goals that they need to diversify the global currency and financial system. And I think it's well documented now by my initially sharing of the slides uh, of how um, IMF share of voting rights, India and China, are very far behind, uh, despite contributing significantly to the global economy. Uh, so there was a need, and that's why BRICS was formed. Uh, but one of the challenges that uh, all these countries face, uh, and Russia has faced now, and uh, they are I mean, they are doing decently okay so far, although the sample, you know, the time period of seven months is no, you know, period to decide whether this can be sustainable. But all these major currencies hold a lot of US dollar uh, as part of their foreign exchange reserves. So if they compete against US dollar and US dollar's value depreciates, because if a global reserve currency uh, is getting challenged and the trust towards them depreciates, there, the value of that currency will go down. That happened during the Bank of Amsterdam time. Amsterdam time uh, that happened with the British pound sterling, um, and uh, this would happen with U.S. dollar if there is a strong candidate for competition for U.S. dollar. So uh, the dollar's depreciation also brings a challenge for these currencies uh, and for these countries. But as we are seeing. Uh, China is holding a lot more gold now. Russia is holding a lot more gold now as part of their central bank reserves. Uh, and so is India. Uh, so there are works being done by the respective nation central banks. Uh, but still, the lion's share of foreign exchange reserves is still US dollar across these five countries. So um, we heard during this uh, June BRICS annual summit that President Putin said that uh, they are working on a BRICS digital currency. Uh, people are calling it a BRICS coin. Um, who knows what the, it will be called at the end of the day, but there are some pundits out there that are calling it BRICS coin. Um, but I have to say that the infrastructure at the moment is not ready for a cross-border currency like uh, euro or a special drawing rights kind of a currency. Uh, the nations are just not there. China is leading the way with their infrastructure and Russia is closely following, um, especially since this year. Uh, but the other three nations, they are still far behind. Uh, the Indian government has announced that they would be interested, uh, not interested, they are working on a central bank digital currency, but it's nowhere near. Uh, China, as we know, it's in pilot mode. 
you know, they have introduced the e yuan in many uh, uh, regions of China as well. Uh, so the infrastructure for the de-dollarization to occur is just not there yet. It's going to take some time. Uh, that is one um, you know, observation that I've noticed after studying this matter. The other point is that BRICS would face significant separation costs. Um, and the most immediate ones would be the increased cost of cross-border transactions. Um, and majority of the macroeconomic raising that happens among countries happen with dollar-based um, uh, denomination. So to change that and transition to this uh, uniform region unified currency, uh, the BRICS currency um, is gonna be more expensive as well. As you know, we're going through a global inflationary environment, uh, especially in the Western world. And uh, the way US dollar has appreciated depicts that people still consider US dollar a safe haven currency and Euro has depreciated. Um, so Euro is considered a risk on currency and uh, uh, US dollar is considered a risk off currency. Uh, that just shows that uh, it's, it's still, we are still very far away uh, from seeing dollar getting dethroned as a global reserve currency since the world and a lot of investors, uh, institutional investor um, and nations consider dollar as the safe haven currency. But uh, having ta talked about that, um, I would like to point out that there has been some actual tangible headwinds done by the BRICS nation. And that is one of their ambitious efforts, which was the BRICS pay system. Uh, this was the, a single contactless payment system that connects each of the BRICS nation's payment system with the ex exception of South Africa, because they didn't have one. Uh, and that's why this was piloted in South Africa. Uh, so the BRICS pay uh, system, which is uh, in China, it's like the Union Pay. Uh, in India, it's RuPay. Um, so these sort of MasterCard and Visa alternatives that are developed within the countries, uh, BRICS formed their own payment network, uh, which is called BRICS Pay, and that was piloted in South Africa in April 2019. So there has been significant steps done uh, to work by BRICS uh, to make this happen. Um, and we're going to be seeing more about BRICS Pay and going to be hearing more about BRICS Pay uh, over time now since uh, uh, President Putin has, you know, led the intentions that we need to work on it more during the recent annual summit. Um, but yeah, it's already in work. The pilot was done in 2019. We're going to see and hear more about BRICS Pay more uh, in future. Now, coming back to what's happening with um, you know, the cryptocurrency or the uniform currency. To be honest, uh, in my reading and in my uh, study, the jury is still out there. But uh, in my humble opinion, BRICS currency, the evolution of how it will go is firstly in a very special drawing rights kind of mode. Um, and I'll speak why. Uh, but uh, the BRICS cryptocurrency would be followed after the payment network. Um, and one of the key technology, and this is a technology that I study a lot about, and that's why uh, this topic is of interest to me, is blockchain technology. So blockchain technology uh, has been uh, you know, spoken about during these BRICS annual summit uh, and by the parties who are actually working on it, uh, that it is going to be the underpinning technology that is going to create this payment mechanism uh, and this currency. Uh, so I believe you're going to see a lot more about and hear more about blockchain technology as well uh, around this BRICS payment system, uh, as well as their uh, digital currency. China is obviously leading not only among BRICS nations, but in the world when it comes to central bank digital currency. Uh, they were very early in talking about it in 2014. And uh, I know from some of my friends who attended the Winter Olympics uh, in China that, uh, uh, you know, they, they were given a wallet and they were also introduced to digital yuan. So China definitely leads the globe when it comes to their central bank digital currency project. And uh, from what I've seen from U.S., and from what I have heard and known about from India, as well as what they are doing about their central bank digital currency, 
uh, China is definitely the gold standard and a lot of learnings are being taken uh, by the architecture of the China's uh, central bank digital currency. Now, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm, I'm of the opinion that BRICS currency is not gonna be like a Euro currency um, is because of the different macroeconomical um, monetary system that all these nations follow. So we, all these countries have got a different rate of refinancing. In India, it's called the repo rate, but basically it's the interest rate. Um, this is an old graph uh, that was done uh, by an author, but uh, it's gonna take a long time before our monetary uh, policies align to a level where we can have a unified central bank uh, like ECB out, uh, like ECB in uh, European Union. Um, and we already know, and actually I don't have it in this slide, but if anybody Googles about me, they'll know that uh, during the start of my career uh, as a trader, looking at, uh, uh, looking at uh, you know, uh, currencies out there, um, I actually called for uh, Euro to go down to parity um, eventually and uh, this was something that I called in 2012, and this eventually happened this year. Uh, so it's very challenging to have a regional unified currency that doesn't align with the physical policies of the nations. And that's where the challenge would lie. So one is the monetary policy challenge and how do we set the stage that all these five nations have a uniform uh, interest rate. Um, and then also the physical challenges of these five nations to align to that shared interest rate. Um, so I think uh, I have probably uh, taken a lot more time, so I'll just go quickly through it. Um, basically, my conclusion is that uh, overwhelming majority of assets in the world are expressed in US dollars. So the introduction of the new digital currency is going to take time to influence the de-dollarization of the global economy at a large scale. Um, physical policy coordination is gonna be extremely tough within these five nations and uh, the creation of CBDC and the extensive use of BRICS pay that we're gonna see the joint efforts on research on blockchain technology. They are the pillars that are gonna help, uh, help eventually BRICS uh, reach a stage where they can have a region unified currency. Uh, but I believe it's going to be starting with intra BRICS trade. So we're going to see the initial form of BRICS currency if it gets formed as somewhat like a special drawing right rather than a euro unified currency. Uh, that was it. That was my keynote presentation. I didn't look at the Q&A in chat, but uh, when I saw the notification of chat, I thought that was the indication that I'm going over time. Uh, so that's why I was quick. Uh, but yeah, that was it. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Thank you, Professor Shiv, for such an insightful presentation. And actually, everybody was like very excited to get into the discussion point because there might be some a lot of questions coming up along with your presentation. So now we've reached to the discussion session. I will let me kindly invite Professor Michael and Professor David to the floor. And uh, okay, okay. So if you don't mind, let me toss the let me first toss the mic to Professor Michael if he has any comments or other questions that he can begin the discussion session. Yeah. So I, you know, I actually have been writing extensively on this topic. Um, I think we we're we're in this really quick storm. Uh, moment in history, right? Uh, some some macro events happening to really push this, right? We have uh, the basis, right, which I uh, was talking about, which is the technology disruption of blockchain and digital currencies. And you got nine out of 10 central banks, according to the Bank of International Settlements, researching or already deploying uh, their central bank digital currencies. So this is happening, okay? But the, the institutional adoption of the technology has reached an inflection point and will continue, right? And this is all set underneath the uh, this macro situation. I think everybody's aware that the world is falling apart, really. And uh, uh, I think most people would say that uh, we're, we're in for a, a bumpy ride with um, potentially the greatest 
global financial crisis in history looming. Uh, and you know all the nations of the world in serious debt and, and money printing. She was talking about the U.S. dollar. Almost a quarter of the uh, world's U.S. dollars was printed in the last couple of years. You know we had six trillion dollars of stimulus from from the U.S. in just the last couple of years. So um, you know uh, a lot of is uh, issues with the interest rates and and uh, with uh, debt and with default and with a, a global crisis. Uh, and then we got all the geopolitical stuff. We got the U.S.-China tensions, and then we got the uh, you know Ukraine-Russian uh, situation. Uh, Shiv mentioned uh, importantly that uh, this was a demonstration of U.S. dominance in the international monetary system. Right when uh, three hundred billion dollars, uh, half of Russian uh, foreign assets for from the central bank can be unilaterally frozen just because U.S. does not like Russia because of uh, the policy, they can just freeze assets. Uh, cut them out of SWIFT, and, and, in for, and the whole point is to put financial pressure. So, the, you know, you, uh, Russia cannot use U.S. dollar, even if it's foreign dollar, right? They made a determination that if it goes through, it technically goes through a U.S. correspondent banking system. So even if you hold U.S. dollar and try to use it, you're in violation of sanctions, right? And this is, you know, they, they, they don't want Russia, they want Russia to default on all of the loans. So even though Russia has the money, wants to pay all these other, other nations, the US is applying, I would say, these uh, you know, rather aggressive tactics. Because the whole world is watching, right? And China knows that it's next. So uh, you know, there, there's a, a very strong motive and incentive to potentially get off of SWIFT. And SWIFT is a, um, what is it, six or seven decade old system. I mean, I don't know if you use a, a you know, 70 year old computer these days, right? Uh, the, 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 Technology is obsolete, right? Okay, so this is the whirlwind that's happening uh, in 2022. And uh, I think it all points to uh, the, the main thesis of Shiv, which is to say uh, uh, a lot of these nations who feel like they got the short end of the stick and are potentially um, uh, in a position to change it uh, are motivated to do so. Okay, and then technology comes in to do that. So uh, I'll end there. I don't want to give a big soliloquy, but I'm just setting the stage for why this is happening. And I have some, some deep commentary on how we'll probably evolve with respect to the, uh, the, current, the, the, the digital currency stuff itself, and, and specifically with respect to um, the fact that the new technology can change the old ways of thinking. Okay, so, so for example, the idea of a, uh, you know, BRICS, currency itself, uh, although they're moving toward that direction, uh, maybe in my opinion, okay, I'll be controversial in saying this, outdated. We don't even need that because we, with digitization of the currency itself, we can have direct bilateral settlement. We have all these advanced DeFi techniques that can pull liquidity, solve some of the issues to, uh, that they're, they're facing, uh, which would affect the monetary and, and fiscal policy, uh, the strategy of, of these nations. So I think there's the disruption of the technologies uh, uh, side would allow a, a much more rich palette of uh, design space to move in this direction than the traditional thinking of, oh, okay, now US dollars are you know, coming down. Do we create a, a super national uh, currency, which was talked about since, since Bretton Woods too? Uh, we can change that uh, uh, logic. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you for the uh, comments, Professor Michael. I also really agree that the, the, the world has moved very fast, but in terms of like finance area and the education area, we've been like stick to a very old way of doing it. So Professor David, do you have any comments on this or any questions that you would like to ask? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you first, Xi, for um, putting all this together. I think it's a very good background for, for people who are interested in, uh, interested in this topic. I think today, with all the, as both professors said, the, the, there is like a perfect storm for change. And that's for sure. I think everyone's agree with that, but uh, the problem is how, right? So who and the, the real, real uh, things. So um, like Michael, when, when three of us uh, talked about this, we said we need to be a little bit controversial to make it interesting. Uh, so I will, 
play that role <laughs> and with a disclaimer. This doesn't represent any of uh, my university or any organization that I consult and work with. It's just purely my, um, my opinion. So uh, what she, uh, she mentioned was really, you know, um, what if we didn't have the blockchain or all this digital digitization, digital currency, that would be how the world monetary system may evolve. Okay, you know, the multipolar world and uh, we're just using the same technology, you know, the SIPs, um, the, you know, the Chinese uh, system and we use uh, the same basket of money like, uh, you know, I left it. Uh, but I think um, that still doesn't get away from the fundamental defects of those um, infrastructure. It's both technical and, uh, I guess, um, structure. And I think um, uh, I'm not sure how how far this uh, bricks. Bucks of money went. Uh, of course, Putin said something, and of course, you know, the media will play it up. But I do know there are some real uh, uh, effort uh, that is uh, really taking advantage of both the changes in the macro environment, uh, the politics and everything, but also specifically taking advantage of technology. I think she even, Michael both mentioned blockchain and so on, but most specifically, I think if we create a bucket of, you know, monetary uh, unit for the BRICS or using um, a bilateral payment network, which are, has been successful for SWIFT, for visa, for US dollar. So creating a similar regional infrastructure, um, mimicking those uh, design will not succeed. I think number one, for example, why, why, um, why a basket of money will not succeed is because there is no political cohesion among this you know, region. I think Europe is pretty strong, but I don't think there is such a strong political cohesion between India, China, and, and all these regions. And so that's why a uh, different approach, like what um, uh, we do have a, um, a project that is uh, studied by um, uh, some professors in uh, South Africa, but we invited the BRICS country, Central Bank together, we called it uh, CBDC, uh, you know, a, a kind of, uh, you want to call it the bridge or um, decentralized type of payment system based on uh, each country having its own central bank di digital currency as a technology foundation where the, I mean, the reason we need a settlement currency is because we do trade, right? So if we can uh, make a case where we can still have a sovereign currency for each country, but we can because everything is digitized, the goods itself that have been traded, as well as the currency being digitized on the same infrastructure. So there could be better ways where uh, without having a critical rule of thumb, you know, who's more powerful to have the percentage on this basket of, uh, of um, currency, we could use the CBDC as a payment network of each country, but we can choose something where you know the current um, uh, uh, you know foreign exchange mechanism could be used for retail, for tourism, and things, but for different type of trade. For example, if we are talking about world trade between the region, there is a very complementary things can be uh, used leverage. For example, uh, we're 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 developing. Uh, kind of, not the currency of basket based on fiat, but based on the goods itself. Because now we have accurate information of the oil, right? The minerals and all the goods that have been traded among these countries, a selection of these goods. And if we can uh, separate the ownership of those goods uh, with on the blockchain, with our blockchain technology and uh, as a smart contract, to guarantee the regulation are enforced through this smart uh, contract. Uh, so we have a way where we have a CBDC network where for each individual trader of the country, they're using the local currency, but there is a mechanism, a unit of account 
was based on uh, goods itself, the value of the goods based on the contract or the market and so on and so forth. It can be used as both uh, trade finance as well as, as well as a settlement instrument. This is um, uh, some of research we're working on and the, the results are presented uh, as a result of a BRICS CBDC um, network for promotion of intra BRICS country trade not a universal currency for everything. Because I think, you know, as I said, maybe some type of uh, visa network, e uh, like payment network between BRICS can be used for retail, right? And the CBDC could sit on that, but for trade, it's um, business to business uh, and it's a completely different uh, requirement. They need trade finance, it's not paid, uh, you know, um, immediately. And those things will require different infrastructure uh, to, uh, to unify, you know, the currency as well as the uh, payment network. So we have created some um, uh, proposals that is not a unified currency for the BRIC country, but each country respect their own uh, sovereign currency, but using digital form because of they are all digitized on the blockchain, we can have different uh, technology, especially the smart contract technology to make sure whatever the regulations concerning that sector, like internet trade, you have customs, you have uh, money laundering, all of those rules are followed because of you have very uh, uh, good visibility and the security around those transactions. Then maybe there's, better way um, from, a, from a bottom up, a technology view, rather than a top down, you know, or a, um, a special joint rights kind of approach to solve this problem. And uh, this way we actually truly leverage the digitization of our daily life, including, you know, trade and everything. And I think this is what I would say um, to, to conclude, I think, the um, writings on the wall, the world is changing. There will be a new uh, reserve currency, uh, settlement currency, uh, different ways of finance all this trade to avoid all the frictions, not only sanction, just general friction, all of those problems. And we could use a technology to address this uh, issue in a, in a unified way. And that's the kind of approach I think uh, I would I would say a better way of succeed rather than using old um, existing infrastructure and design just make it regional. So um, hopefully that's 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 some you know different opinion that I I kind of presented injected into this discussion. Hopefully uh, we can stop and answer questions from the audience. Before we move on to the Q&A session, uh, Professor Michael, would you like to, uh, you raise a hand? Yeah, yeah just, just real quick, just a comment to follow up on, on, on uh, Professor Wen's comments. Um, you know, let's put the context here, right? Why do we have the US dollar as this global reserve? Okay, I, the historical perspective was after Bretton Woods, which was this uh, important meeting of all these uh, member nations after World War II. The world's destroyed and in and, 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 and shambles and we need to create a new monetary system. And at the time, there were basically two competing uh, ideas. There was, uh, you know, uh, John Maynard Keynes leading U uh, UK with the consortia to try to create a supranational currency. OK, so this would be many membership nations come together to create a, a, a new international standard for a currency. And then there's the US was the most powerful uh, at the time because they were the one least ravaged by the world and, and, and most economic superpower uh, basically said, hey, we'll just use the US dollar. All you guys just basically pegged to the US or exchange with the US dollar, we'll back our US dollar with gold and then uh, you know we'll do it, right? So, so because of the US leverage, uh, US won out. Okay, so the, all of a sudden overnight, the US became the global reserve. Uh, but what happened, right? Uh, two, the, the one, Two things happened, right? Uh, one, eventually the US dollar depecked, okay? Uh, or, or got off the uh, gold standard, okay? So before it's backed by, you know, millennial old gold, right? So that's a, a good price reference. But then in the 70, uh, Nixon 
Nixon decided that they didn't want to do this. And all of a sudden, the U.S. had uh, basically a true fiat currency not backed by anything, which allowed the U.S. to print money while basically everyone else in the world had to uh, uh, still use U.S. dollar. And so, therefore, it gave what the U.S. now has, what we call exorbitant uh, privilege to be able to uh, print money at will to finance its wars and economy and, and, and stimulus and things like that. And everyone else basically has to, uh, you know, write the checks for it. Right. And then so 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 why do I mention all this? Right. It's, it's because the U.S. The, the unique advantage of the U.S. dollar is really in the liquidity. OK, as, as Shiv showed in the data, 90 percent of all trade pairs for uh, any FX transaction, the U.S. dollar is on one side of it. Right. So if you're a small nation you, and, and you're trying to trade with another small nation, you need to go through U.S. dollar because it's the high, most liquid, uh, you know, trade pair to reduce your cost of trade, your FX trade. Right. OK, so but but now we're moving to a new world of digital currencies. OK, what does that give you when we digitize something? Right. But when we digitize information 20 years ago with the Internet, what do we do before information was locked in a a library or an offline computer and if you actually had to get at it you would have to physically go you know drive to the library to get access to the information the digitization made it so that everybody in their laptops could get access to uh to information around the world so basically it removed borders okay instantaneous across geographies across institutions uh you know and and also because of the digitization the cost of delivering that went to zero Okay, so that means apply that to money now. Okay, I can get to access to global liquidity, right? And I can get access to siloed amounts of uh, liquidity, which is now in this institution, the IMF over here, retail people over here, you know, JP Morgan over here, and I can pull all that global liquidity, right? So now the technology allows me to reduce the cost of the FX uh, using technology, not because you just have a big pool in the US dollar case. Okay, so so I think one technology can solve what I believe to be the primary uh, problem with regard to a new digital currency, which is liquidity. Okay, and the second point is, you know, before you have to, you, you know, you, you again, you're using US dollar as the reference trade pair, right? You go, I go from small uh, local currency to US dollar, US dollar to small local currency. But now the technology allows these two small member nations to directly bilaterally settle in their local currencies with liquidity provided by from this global pool that uh, from the technology does not need a reserve currency in between okay so so this is why i mean the the notion of a say global reserve currency itself could be outdated because the technology allows you to have any two trade pairs with high liquidity in, in, in the future to bilaterally settle Okay, so I think that, you know, uh, following on uh, David's point is what we're moving toward. Okay, we're not talking about the old machinery. We're talking about every member nation. Again, nine out of 10 around the world are, are doing this, right? In three to five years, it's going to be digital euro, digital, you know, uh, turkey, a uh, kroner, right? All, all these things will, will have their own CBDCs. They'll, they have, they're already doing experiments to be able to uh, 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 clear and settle these things and provide liquidity. And we're going to end up with a much more multipolar world, not a centralized, you know, super na national cur uh, currency, but, you know, everybody can have their currency, you know, and, and it's not just nations, right? It, we have this whole private sector stablecoin market, any, you know, any individual, okay? The same way that, um, uh, you know, like everybody now uh, can, can broadcast themselves using TikTok, right? Before you needed to have a lot of, you, you need to own a TV station, right? Now, anybody with a cell phone can do it. It's the same thing. Uh, the democratization of these tools will allow anybody to create their own regional stable coin network. I have five friends. I want to create a local stable coin of my, my coin just to play around in my own little, little, little pool. It uh, doesn't matter, okay? And all of this will feed into global liquidity using modern DeFi techniques and stuff like that. So we're going to end up in a world where uh, there is... Uh, isn't a need for a centralized system like SWIFT anymore.
Thank you. Thank you for your point, Michael, uh, Professor Michael. I think while we're having a huge, fierce discussion, controversial discussion here, and then due to the technology development, there should, there should be a new solution for it. But when the new solution came, I believe there would be another concerns or another problems that is made out of that new solution. So, and then at Professor Schiff's presentation was more or less like a brief introduction, but I also wanted to hear of Professor Schiff's point, where you stand it regarding this BRICS currency and it's a, whether it solves the financial inclusion, the problem of financial inclusion. And maybe along with, you can summarize the discussion that happened in the Q&A box that you had uh, with the Harvard. Yeah, sure, thank you. Look, I really enjoyed uh, points that Professor David and Professor Michael raised because um, they are very alternative to what I uh, was thinking. And I agree with both of them uh, that uh, it could be an energy-backed currency as well. Um, I do recall, and there is a very famous newspaper article. If uh, somebody Googles um, Henry Ford, uh, the person who you know invented the low-cost automobile in America back in the day, um, the founder of Ford Motor Company, uh, Henry Ford uh, in uh, early, I think so, uh, 20th century, I believe, said that uh, if you allow me to create, uh, like if you allow me to design a uh, currency based, backed by energy, that'll be the world reserve currency. Uh, and there is a newspaper headline about that as well. So it could be, um, you know, an energy backed currency as well. Um, although, Again, as uh, as we know, um, energy markets are highly rigged. I mean, it may be controversial. Again, it's good disclaimer, Professor David said. It's my opinion as well. Energy markets uh, have got a lot of centralization as well in it. There are very few participants then that you know dictate the price of energy. And we know some of the nations that have got heavy influence, uh, you know, on the price of oil. I'm not going to go talk about gold. Uh, because the whole mechanism of how gold is valued uh, is also another controversial subject if somebody digs deep into it. Um, so I do agree, like I would ideally like what Professor Michael said, that we live in a world where there is no reserve currency. Um, however, I feel having studied, you know, the history and evolution of money and just how human beings have evolved, um, I've come to the conclusion that uh, that wars are going to be an unfortunate reality of our human society. That the constant uh, uh, that constant uh, you know rivalry and insecurity about resources, whatever type of resources it is, is going to be part of human society. And when that sort of uh, you know uh, emotions exist at a macro level, there needs to be like a centralized entity. Um, in my humble opinion, uh, that, you know, kind of controls it. And the evolution of the power that we see over time is actually healthy. Um, that's just the conclusion that I've derived. But I would love to live in a world uh, uh, that, uh, you know, everybody is able to just trade with one another with no centralized entity kind of supervising, uh, you know, as to what the nations need to do. Uh, because as we can see at the moment, uh, like how uh, U.S. is treating their national currency as, uh, uh, you know, as as an asset in their war against Russia, uh, that is not what a global reserve currency should be doing. Global reserve currency should be neutral. Um, but yeah, I just don't see that ever happening in reality. I think we'll always have a reserve currency. Um, and uh, I've answered most of the questions that Herbert had pointed out, uh, which were really good. Um, I also do agree that uh, all of the national currencies that we see, they are going to be digitized. Because one of the things that we see the benefits of digitizing is there we see an increase in velocity. We see an increase in trades when anything gets digitized. So Professor Michael gave a very good example. When information got digitized through the internet, we started receiving information fast. There are challenges of that as well. Now we've got a lot of fake news. Now it's not about accurate news. Now it's all about 
you know, who gets the information fast, whether it's right or wrong. So there are some challenges when we digitize and increase the velocity uh, of a certain valuable uh, commodity and currency is of value, uh, just like information is of value. So with the digitized, uh, uh, you know, with the increased digitization of all the global currencies out there, uh, we're going to see increase in trade, but that might not necessarily be a good thing as well. You know, we just need to wait and watch how that would occur. And I think Herbert had, uh, you know, spoken about that multiple CBDCs, uh, you know, there is going to be multiple technological challenges then. I totally agree with him. Uh, central bank digital currency, the concept of it was, uh, you know, people already had a concept about it, but it's only after the evolution of uh, uh, public permissionless blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum that uh, people started paying attention that, hey, we can use this technology for our fiat currencies as well. And China led the way uh, by introducing their CBDC and they reached a stage where it's kind of mature compared to other nations. I know Barbados uh, is another Caribbean island nation that is very ahead when it comes to their design of central bank digital currency. But other nations, they are nowhere near. America recently, you know, did a paper. So about how their central bank digital currency would look like, India hasn't even come up with any sort of paper. Uh, so uh, I think what Herbert comment about the central bank digital currency is accurate. I don't see central bank digital currency being used as cross-border uh, trading, uh, you know, instrument uh, at least till 2040 or 2050, based on how these technologies get evolved. Uh, and once they, you know, once they do the stress testing, once they find out the privacy measures, the good privacy measures for this central bank digital currency, uh, then they're going to be using it. And once they use it, it's going to be like SWIFT, I believe. Uh, SWIFT took so many years to evolve. It's still not evolved uh, in the sense nobody can compete against SWIFT. Uh, so similarly, we're going to see if uh, central bank digital currency is used for trading, I believe it would be, it's just a matter of time uh, that uh, we're not gonna find a competition for it. Uh, coming back to your point about financial inclusion, uh, that is more at a country to country level, I believe. Um, more, I think, I think Shiv is stuck. Hello, Shiv. Can you hear us? Mm -hmm. um, while we're waiting for him to return, I think as much as I love this discussion and it will go far as long as it could, uh, the time has reached up. So maybe we should cover up the one final question, which is raised by uh, Renata. So she was asked, she or he was asking for me, um, in five or more years, there will be digital, digital currency in Europe and Turkey, uh, where you'll be able to do transactions by using your phone. But it's pretty easy for the such as developed countries, but what about the underdeveloped countries who are difficult, who are having a difficulty in acquiring these technologies? So on this question, um, Hello? Sure. Yeah. All right. Okay. D David, you want to speak? No. Yeah. Um, let me speak on these underdeveloped countries. Uh, I want to correct the ship as well. Uh, central bank, uh, central bank digital currency is not really completely because of Bitcoin. I started a company in 2011 doing, uh, it's called e-currency. So we have been working on providing solution to digitize the cash in African continent for since 2011, before any central bank actually thinking about it. Of course, Bitcoin kind of accelerated uh, that trend. So the central bank felt kind of threatened so that they uh, also jumped on this, uh, you know, to make it easier. Everybody knows there's Bitcoin and central bank currency gets kind of, uh, you know, accelerated. Um, so for me, the central bank digital currency was not because of, you know, this universal Bitcoin where everyone is free to use and so on, but it's really solving a practical problem where in the uh, African continent and all these countries where uh, it's a cash society. And when the mobile phone come, they were using minutes to, you know, the send the money around, which was fantastic 
for financial inclusion. You know, the velocity of money all accelerated, but it brings risk. So the technology comes in to reduce risk. I can see the same thing. Just as Michael mentioned, I think I totally agree. That is, there may be no need for a universal reserve currency because you have different sectors. People who live in the games world or live in the metaverse for whatever they feel like to. There is no need for universal currency so that people money laundering, using the game and so on. They just use whatever, you know, regulated, of course, you can have all the rules defined. No rules said what currency uh, need to be used. The rules just said you don't money launder, right? you don't cheat people, you don't steal. If we can figure out the way, technology way, to decentralize, to democratize these kind of rules in each different uh, sector, and I think they would hugely help people in different sectors because if you use universal one, like credit, people with a good credit has everything, people with cash only has nothing, right? So if we can create this kind of small circle, you have small business you know, needs, you have people with trade, you have people just playing very well in the game world, in the metaverse. If we could have the technology to really help the people that are doing good and to prevent the people to monopolize information, monopolize reserve currency, monopolize SWIFT, the world will be better. So this is my hope that what we're doing is useful. It's not because America is, is bad or China is it's not about this. It's to make sure the bad things does not happen, even for US, for China, for India, for every country. And uh, I don't want to drag too long. That's my answer for this financial inclusion. Thank you. Professor Michael, do you have anything to add up on the Professor David? No, I mean, I, I, I just follow by saying, actually, it, in my opinion, uh, it's the, um, the, the, the more developing nations that's going to leapfrog into this new world uh, first. Um, you know, the U.S. has such a nice uh, system with credit cards and whatever uh, that they didn't feel a need to jump off of it for a very long time. So for mobile payments, for example, China is one where 96 percent of, you know, transactions, uh, uh, you know, are controlled by Alipay or whatever. They've been cashless for, for, for half a decade. Right. So so likewise, the pain points of the developing world, which is. If I want to do trade, okay, I can do so effectively. You go to Africa, I can't get U.S. dollar. I can't get a bank account. Even I get U.S. dollar, I need to bribe someone for weeks and stuff like that. So the cost of trading is high, right? And in, I can't, I can't get investment, right? Nobody's going to invest in my stuff. Uh, I can't invest in something beyond inflation. And so these are the issues where the poor stay poor because they don't have access to the means of financial uh you know uh, uh, uh machinery to be able to, to be prosperous okay so now comes a cell phone right and the cell phone has you know a wallet on it and now i can do cross-border trade in a regulated way pretty soon right and i can invest my excess money to get liquid to provide liquidity for the world but i can earn a yield and i can eventually get investment and i can digitize and do all these things uh that's going to be massively transformative there's 1.7 uh billion unbanked people right and uh most of them have cell phones. And even beyond that, we can even say, even if you don't have a cell phone, modern day technologies uh, you know, are, are, are there to give you like a smart card type thing where you can do a cryptographically secure transaction, whatever, right? So I think um, this is already basically commoditized technology. It's just about adoption in the world. And I feel that adoption uh, uh, will happen in the developing countries first. Southeast Asia, Africa, Latin America, right? This is where you're seeing massive disruption. Notably, these are the areas which have the highest adoption of cryptocurrency as well, because they use it as a means, an alternative means to the existing system, which they don't have access to. Thank you for adding up uh, such a wonderful insights and uh, from a different perspective. And I really appreciate Professor David and Professor Michael, your time to join this discussion so that it, the presentation becomes so as up, so much bad values as up. So I would love to conclude this webinar with uh, Professor Shiv Meta's final remarks. Uh, Professor Shiv. Thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for that uh quick uh, you know, sway of asking questions while my network router stopped working. So thank you for that. Um, just quick points. I think I agree with Professor David, uh, maybe in my 
you know, articulation uh, might have suggested in a way that Bitcoin kind of paved the way for central bank digital currencies to be created. But no, uh, what I meant is that the design of central bank digital currencies were already in the mind of people. But yeah, with Bitcoin, it started accelerating that they need to actually start actually implementing and start uh, creating a working version of it. Um, I was talking about the financial inclusion and then technology happened in my life. Uh, just make a quick point about uh, um, you know financial inclusion. I agree with Professor Michael. Um, and just to elaborate and just to fall, you know add up to that conversation is that um, I actually come from, I, I have a middle opinion about different uh, schools of economic. There is the neoclassical economics, there is Keynesian, and then there is Austrian eco economics. Uh, you know, I like to study all of that. Um, and I strongly believe in the Cantillon effect uh, that is spoken uh, to people who have studied Austrian ec economics uh, that suggests that money is not neutral and, uh, you know, it has a permanent long run effect and uh, it has immediate short run effects as well. Uh, and basically, to summarize, it dictates that um, people that who are, uh, you know, closer to the money supply, which are the bankers, commercial bankers and all. Uh, and asset uh, owners, uh, they have more advantage and more benefit uh, when there is quantitative easing. And that's why we have witnessed income inequality rising uh, in nations like America after a global financial crisis. So with central bank digital currency, we will definitely see more financial inclusion. And um, I still haven't figured out what's going to be the role. The commercial banks, commercial banks will have a big role. But if central bank digital currency that program money is directly supplied from central bankers to people's wallet, the individual citizens wallet, what is going to be, you know, what's what's going to be the impact on commercial banks there? But I can definitely say that some of that Cantillon effect uh, will vanish uh, and financial inclusion will thrive in a central bank digital currency world. Uh, but if we talk about smart contract enabled programmable money world, then that's where central banks would have a responsibility to ensure that they don't use that power, uh, you know, in creating a dystopian black mirror kind of a, a society. Um, but yeah, just as a closing remark for what this BRICS currency topic is, uh, look, I believe that when we talk about technology and uh, investments or financial markets in general, uh, geopolitics actually is not uh, factored in much. Um, when we look at, uh, even when we look at curriculums, you know, like CFA, for example, they don't talk about geopolitics uh, when we analyze stocks or we, when we analyze global macro uh, as much. They do talk about geopolitics within their curriculum, but not as much. And I believe that geopolitics uh, in an increasingly uncertain world and uh, as Professor Michael uh, said initially with his opening remark, in an increasingly de-globalized world where regional politics is increasing and national, the vibe of nationalism is increasing, uh, we need to factor in the role geopolitics and those uh, political emotions play. Um, and that also coming with technology. So I believe technology will eventually mature that uh, we can have decentralization of payments and decentralization of global trade mechanism. Uh, but whether it would happen or not, I think it would not only because of the political messaging being underpinned and uh, you know the leaders and how they rule over countries or how they govern countries, uh, they would like to still exercise some control on uh, how they exercise their power over the economy. Thank you for the final remark. Actually, it already leads such a so many discussion points that I think we should make this as a third episode and continue this discussion. So I think today's panelists and guest speakers, the arrangement of it was really amazing. Uh, the combination of the discussion and the uh, guest uh, the keynote delivered by Professor Shu, Professor David, Professor Michael, thank you so much for your valuable time. And I would like to extend our gratitude to all the participants for their time and joining this webinar. So we would like, we're, we're really looking forward to seeing all of you for the second, third webinar series of the BRICS, series, BRICS webinar series. And hope we see you again. Yeah, thank you everyone. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank, thank you. you.
Bye. Bye-bye.